we have to do that. All right. We're actually going to do this in just two more sessions. Next time we'll finish all the last part of Act 4 and all of Act 5. And then we'll, the last meeting we'll just go through the, uh, the main theme for it all. All right, we're at Act 3, Scene 3, which we aren't going to read, but it's a very gruesome scene. Two murderers are out in the night, and just before they're getting ready to murder Banquo, a third murderer shows up. And the first two are put out, and they say they don't need any help because they've been given very exact directions on how to carry out their duties, and they know how to do it. They don't have any choice in the matter because before they can do anything, Banquo and Cleons are there, and they have to accept him. And Banquo and Cleons enter walking their horses, which means they're fairly close to the uh, castle, which is the way Macbeth had it planned, because close to the castle people walk the horses rather than ride them. And uh, the murderers fall upon them, and they do in uh, Banquo, who with his dying breath uh, has Cleons uh, escape the flee to uh, revenge him at a later time. Uh, so we're, that's, that's all that happens in the scene. What we're, one of the things that we're looking at in all of this is that um, black magic in some way is an inversion of uh, creation. It's using the creative energy to be Joy rather than to cooperate with the creative plan. Macbeth is, as we have seen all along, he's not sure of himself. And he sees this unsurety in himself in others around him. He fears that the murderers might be just as treacherous or just as inept as he is. So he tries to uh, recruit more, and I think it's sort of something like the idea that there is safety in numbers. If I have enough murderers out there, they sure to get everybody. Uh, he feels that numbers will overcome uh, his own insecurity and the dishonesty of others. This truly doesn't work, because uh, numbers of people don't make weak characters strong. Uh, it doesn't correct them, nor does it do anything to assuage the insecurity. In fact, often we find it's, it's the opposite. Panic and war psychosis or rumors running wild, uh, the more people that are around, the worse it is. So it actually doesn't help things. However, it doesn't do anything to help character, but it does release more energy. The more people that are together, either positive and in control, or out of control, and in a panic state, the more energy that they can release, and people in groups can release more energy per capita than as individuals. So what this really is, is an inversion of a very positive principle. We see it like if a mathematician proves the theorem, that proof is supposed to be universal, and uh, it should prove universal, and everybody else who looks at it with the same logic and intuition would have to agree uh, that it is true. It's the notion that uh, democracy is supposedly based on and that is that the majority of people are sane and that they see things correctly. However, sometimes it turns out to be faddish or mass insecurity or stuff like that. Nonetheless, numbers don't make something right. However, if someone is correct and if someone is secure, collecting together with others does give them 
a uh, a great strength. We know that that's why we get together to pray, because uh, collectively we have a common purpose. Collectively, each of us has developed a kind of control and positivity that when we do get together, we can very much release a strong energy. So Miss Beth has something of a right principle, but he's got it inverted, so he's got it all backwards. All right, let's look at Acts 2, scene 4. Um, it opens in the castle. If you remember where we left off last time, Bank, uh, Macbeth and Banquo had this conversation in which uh, during the course of the conversation, Macbeth keeps asking Banquo all little questions like, where are you going for your ride? And when do you plan to be, uh, plan to be back? And all of that. And uh, Banquo assures him that he will be back for the state dinner at night. And so scene four opens, actually scene four opens with the seating for the banquet. And Macbeth is doing his best to seem magnanimous and gregarious and the life of the party. However, in the middle of all of this, as people are being seated, one of the murderers walks in and he's got blood on his face. Uh, Macbeth motions him off to the side and they have uh, a very frank conversation in which Macbeth continues to uh, flatter him. He says, Thou art the best of the cutthroats. <laughs> That's quite a, quite a flattery. The murderer tells them that Banquo is dispatched, and uh, this immediately puts uh, Macbeth into a tizzy when he hears that Fleance has escaped. And Macbeth is very much uh, concerned about that. I guess I'll have to read that speech. It's down along 22 to 33. Uh, let's see, he says, there comes my foot again. I had else been perfect. Whole as the marble, founded as the rock, as broad in general as the casing air. But now I am cabined, cribbed, combined, confined, bound to saucy doubt and fear. But thank Lord, sir. And the murderer says something, yeah, he was safe in a ditch. And the best goes on to say, thanks for that. And he's off to the side, he said, There the drawn serpent lies, the worm that fled. Hath nature in time will venom breed, no truth for the present, it be gone. Tomorrow we'll hear ourselves again. So he dispatches the murderer. Once again we see that Macbeth, once he has tried to override the prophecy, once he has tried to override destiny, in fact, what has happened is that he places everything on external. He talks about him being uh, dangerously extroverted. And he doesn't understand the uh, inner meaning. He doesn't understand the significance of the fact that he's trying to override destiny. And so he's fixated on all these particulars outside rather than on what is in him. So if you look at most tragedies, most tragedies do that very thing. Most tragic falls come because people are only looking at the external appearances instead of after any meanings of things. And uh, that is, I think, uh, a reliving of the fall all over again. Because in the fall, in our humanity rebels against the divine plan by using the creative energy to build new bodies at will, but without wisdom, we plunged ourselves into matter detriment of our spiritual insight. And so what 
every uh, great tragedy is is just a reenactment of the fall until we get it through our head, you know, from the repeated things again and again, that too much outwardness without being in touch with the inner meaning and without working with the divine plan and the destiny that it works to just doesn't work. At this point, Lady Macbeth tries to buck him up again, and uh, the ghost of Banquo enters the banquet hall, and it sits in Macbeth's seat. And uh, Macbeth makes some lofty-sounding speech in which he tries to welcome everybody, and he tries to fix his alibi by saying, where is Banquo? And he tries to make Banquo look bad, knowing he's not going to come. Roth is with him, and he says, oh, Banquo's absence just stains his uh, promise. It shows him to be not the man that he says he will. When Macbeth goes to sit, he sees a full table, and the ghost is sitting in his chair, but nobody else can see the ghost. And uh, he says, hey, I, where am I supposed to sit? And they say, hey, it's in this chair right here. And Macbeth says, that chair is occupied. And the Lord starts questioning him. And then Lady Macbeth comes to the rescue. Who wants to read Lady Macbeth? And we'll just read back and forth from about line 54 to 122 where the uh, Lord exit. Anybody want to be Lady Macbeth? We've got a book. Ron, you're the only, you're the only book in the house. What? Uh, it is where Ross says, first, gentlemen rise, his highness is not well. And Lady Macbeth says, sit, worthy friends. I am a bold one that they look on that which might appall the devil. Really, see thee? Behold, look, lo, how say you? Why, what care I, if thou canst not speak true? The charnel houses and our graves must send those that we bury back. Our monument shall be the maws of kites. What? If I stand here, I saw him. Blood hath been shed ere now in the olden time, ere human stature purged the gentle wheel. I, and since two murders have been performed, too terrible for the ear. The time, times have been that when brains were out, the man would die, and there an end. But now they rise again with twenty mortal murders on their crowns and push us from our stools. This is more strange than such a murder is. I do forget, do not muse at me. My most worthy friends, I have a strange infirmity which is nothing to those that know me. Come, love, and help to all. Then I'll sit down, give me some wine, ah, uh, so full. And the ghost comes back and he says, I drink to the general joy of the whole table, and to our dear friend Banquo, who we miss, who would he were here, to all in him we thirst and all to all. So the Lord then say, Our duties and the pledge. Avant and quit my sight. 
Let the earth hide thee, thy bones are marrowless, thy blood is cold, thou hast no speculation in those eyes which thou dost glare with. What man may dare, I dare. Approach thou like the rugged Russian bear, the armed rhinoceros, or the higher king tiger. Take any shape but that, and my firm nerves shall never tremble. Or be alive again, and bear me to the desert with my sword. If trembling I had it then, protect me the baby of a girl. Hence, horrible shadow, unreal mockery, hence. Why so, being gone, I am a man again. Pray you, sit still. Can such be such things be and overcome us like a summer's cloud without special wonder? You make me strange even to the disposition that I owe. When uh, now I think you can behold such sight and keep the natural ruby of your cheek when mine is blanched with fear. Ross says, what sight, my lord? Lennox says, good night and better health attend his majesty. All right. In these talks, we've been talking very freely about psychological processes. And one of those psychological processes that we have talked about is repression. I think I might have created an illusionary kind of uh, environment about this. Because the way we've been talking about it, we might think that depression or repression, even serious repression, is an everyday kind of thing. It might even seem an easy thing to do. But it really is not true. It's very difficult, and ultimately, it proves impossible. If you've ever had a good juicy secret that you were to hold, you see how impossible it is, especially if you're in the company of others that uh, would just really love to know about the secret. It's really difficult to hold it in. And those, you know, like a little secret is just a, a neutral kind of thing relative to a murder. When there are really emotionally charged issues, like multiple murders, it's very difficult to suppress or repress something like that. Because of thoughts and of desires charged with life, and that life comes from created spirit, from God, and that means they're ultimately irrepressible, and they come out years later and come out with full life. When there is success at holding thoughts and desires back, it usually means big trouble. The spirit, as it works through the personality, requires follow-through, and it requires completion. That is how the whole of creation is made real, is by complete follow-through, giving it everything it has. The spirit is exceedingly alive, and whatever receives its impetus is subtle, but indomitable. It just can't be held back when it has that spiritual charge to it. In this case, in this dialogue between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, the things have only been suppressed. They haven't been uh, repressed where they change form and come out in some other way. If you 
note in this whole scene, there are no asides. Everybody can hear what's going on. When she says, you spoiled the whole evening for them, what she really means to say is, you have spilled the beans big time. <laughs> this is all right in the open. So the Macbeths are right in the open because they're so charged with their feelings about having committed these murders, and now a second murder that the upsetting event of Banquo's ghost coming back sets off, off Macbeth, and then he gets into this conversation with his wife, and everything comes out. It can't, it can't be hidden. So this goes, uh, suppression and repression are not very easy to, uh, very easy to accomplish. One more thing to look at before we move on, and that is the appearance of the ghost of Banquo. There are different grades of ghosts with different abilities. At one extreme, there are what are called poltergeists, those tricksters who come back and do all sorts of exaggerated psychic phenomena in this plane. Those are usually beings who, when they were alive, studied some form of magic or occultism, and uh, they practice so that when they left the body, perhaps even before, they learned how to gather and feel the spirit energy which is necessary to persist in the inner world, especially as a lower inner world in some kind of form that can affect the physical plane. They persist in the lower realms because they have the etheric energy, which needs replenishing, and because they have earthly desires. Their personal earthly desires are much more important to them than participating in the whole divine plan and what normally happens after death. Such an individual who has all desire focused on things of the earth and won't let go called an earthbound spirit. They're bound by desire attachment to this realm, and they desire to be here, and it's not some mysterious force that holds them here that's any other than their desire. Banquo is at the other end of the spectrum. He's not a poltergeist. He's an ordinary human being. This ordinary state of humanness makes his appearance as a ghost pretty remarkable. Ordinary human beings have a really hard time appearing out of the spiritual world into this realm and manifesting such a phenomena. That's because the ordinary person has not prepared and does not have the inclination to struggle to stay here. At death, the archetype, the creative thought form that designed their bodies and their life, when the archetype has finished its exoteric work, there's nothing to hold the bodies together and they disintegrate. Part of that disintegration we call purgatory, part of that we call heaven, with all in general, the normal person has a hard time keeping it together unless they have those earthbound kinds of desires. Normally, the forces that we draw together to make our bodies all want to revert to their source, to their primal state. The unwinding is not merely a mechanical unwinding. It has an attitude of relief of letting go, sort of like, let me go home at any cost, sell everything I have. The earthbound people, on the other hand, have this very practical or practice materialistic desire to stay here. They want to, they want to continue their exile in materialism. And very often it's because they want to be big fish 
you know, little pot. It's only in very extreme cases, like a mother's child being in danger when the mother is dead, that the mother will come back and out of the urgency of the situation, go against all the unwinding tendencies and come back to manifest the energy to save that child. It does happen, but it's very uh, extreme that uh, something like that happens. Normally, we're weak. And normally, we're unwinding and we're absorbed in other things, things that we usually neglected when we're here. So why does Banquo return? Most often, both return to uh, stay here until their untimely demise has been brought to the attention of someone so that they can feel justified. That's very unlikely to be the case with Banquo, because he has Pleance. Pleance is witnessed his murder, and so there's no reason why Banquo should uh, come back because uh, there's nothing holding him. The reason I think Banquo came back is because he said he would be there for dinner. That may sound strange, but uh, when the positive controlling factor of the archetype has been shut down and the spirit can't create on the spot spontaneously, the estate's vital body is in such a state that it is in a pure spiric state. And so there it's very much subject to all of the laws in the ethers that normally uh, affect the vital body only now with no strong force, force holding it together. The most immediate and strongest force on the vital body is suggestion. So Banquo said, I'll be there for dinner. And that was the suggestion he placed. His last words at death were for vengeance, so that was another suggestion that was in his body. It's that kind of suggestion, that kind of thought placed in the vital body, that uh, is what is the motivating power for people who were murdered, and nobody knew that they were murdered. Whatever their last thought was, was a really intense suggestion in their vital body that keeps them here. Suggestion can work in this way, even without death. Since we're talking about black magic in this series of talks, suggestion in this manner is frequently used by low-grade black magicians. They have a supposed enemy against whom they propel all their hate. And what love does to some people to make their life full, it does for other people. At both ends of the spectrum are the two strongest motivations, love and hate, or love and vengeance. So what happens is a black magician who feels spited or something like that revs up the hate and then has an image of the person that it hates. And what it does, it has this suggestion of harming or destroying that person and then the black magician takes poison. Enough poison to bring them to the edge of death. So what happens is it's not enough to kill them, but it's enough to force them out of the body. And with that suggestion in mind and that person in mind, they go out and they do their deed. It's a principle that works universally. It's something that we can use ourselves. 
if we can hold a given thought about a given action right until the moment of going to sleep, we can carry it out, even if we're not fully awake in the safe realm. So if uh, we want to go to someone to help them or something like that, if we keep our consciousness on that as we're going to sleep, that suggestion will carry us right to that person and we can do what we can to help them. However, I must suggest that if you enter into this kind of activity, um, you better be ready to uh, be very careful about the ethics, because whatever you do is going to come back to you. The same principle is believed universally by just about everyone. They don't know how important it is. Whenever we lose consciousness, there's insecurity. And so we always try to... Uh, protect ourselves. And I think probably in uh, Christendom, the most common prayer has this very suggestion in it. It says, now I lay me down to, down to sleep. And then the second phrase is based on this. And pray the Lord thy soul to keep. That's placing that kind of positive suggestion when going out. That's probably why there's also that biblical injunction against uh, um, do not let the sun set on your anger. That means don't go to sleep when you're angry because you may do some uh, unintentional mayhem. Now, I would like to read all of scene five. Can we put the book in such a place that uh, a number of... Oh, there's only two people in it. I'll be the first witch. Who wants to be Hecate? Yeah, would you like to be a hacker? <laughs> There's just, uh, I open and then you have a long speech and then I close. I'm the first, I'm the first witch. Why, how now, Hecate? You look angry. <laughs> Okay, how is it? Come, let's make haste. She'll soon be back again. All right. This time we actually meet the queen of sorcery herself, Hecate. Her speech has a number of items of interest in us. It shows uh, that despite her exalted position as the queen of all sorcery, she's still filled with pettiness, with vanity, 
jealousy and exhibition. Jeez, why did you leave me out? I'm the big shot here. Usually it is those very basic desires that are the propellant for black magic. It sort of comes with the turf, and people who are of that kind of magic always deal with that. Along about lines 12 through 14, we're brought to understand that's going to be something that's going to be our major theme tonight, especially in the, for the very end, and that is something that's true about sorcery as much as it is about white magic. There is it's organized. It's organized in that one gets into the whole government of black magic and it's every bit as organized as a lot of big companies are. Most people enter into the path of darkness in that they seek redress through magic for some injustice that they feel has been done to them. And uh, they go to a known magician and they ask for help. And they're given help on the condition that they can be called on later. Where I used to live, I spent quite a bit of time in the uh, border towns in, in the Mexican side where there were brothels. And there was a sorceress there. And it was a tragic thing because uh, a lot of the prostitutes were very young Indian girls, and they were uh, sexually used outside of marriage. And once they were, uh, they, because of Catholicism, they could never be married after that. And for many of them, the only line of living that they could take was to become prostitutes. And even though they saw men as having only sex in mind, they were still normal human beings. And they, uh, uh, <laughs> They wanted to have somebody to love, and they would form these terrible crushes on men, and men used to take advantage of them. They'd know they, they would never have to marry them, but they would act like they were their lovers, and the women would spend their money on them, and they were basically uh, kept men. And sometimes a young woman would want a man very dearly. She would have this crush fantasy relation and she wouldn't know how to get them. And she would go to the witch. And the witch would give her a formula that is very gruesome. It involves feeding a man menstrual blood and uh, without his knowing it, prepared in a certain special way. And after that, uh, she had him somewhat as a zombie pitiful thing because he didn't really love her. You can't make somebody love her, love you. But he was hooked in. And even more pitiful is that she was then hooked in to the witch. And then she had to serve the witch. It was a really, really gruesome kind of thing. So this is also in this statement. It's uh, an outright statement of how sorcerers work by getting people to love them. We mentioned that in the last talk. It's right here in Hickett's speech. There are several little things along lines 22 and 24. Uh, she talks about things being done on the corner of the moon. Again, talking about the quartering of the moon and magical activity and all activities taking place at that time. And it talks about at certain stages of the moon, forces are released from the moon. Mystics such as Anna Blavatsky and Max Heindel and Rudolf Steiner and Paracelsus have all said that the failures of humanity, 
not the uh, stragglers, but the outright failures who got involved in horrible sorcery back in Atlantis and Lemuria, they are kept in control on the moon. Of course, not in bodies like this, but etheric bodies, and therefore there is sort of an etheric miasm associated with the moon, which at some times comes out more than the positive forces which are overwhelming from the moon, but come out. And great warnings are given at about spending too much time in the moon or looking at the moon. Paracelsus, for example, talks about many people that are drawn into illicit affairs and more by being out under a full moon and pruning and doing things of that nature. So again, Hecate is talking about an astrological and, a, and an occult fact that at the corner of the moon, uh, those kinds of forces are much more... Uh, available. And toward the end of her speech, it's very clear that she understands how we're all under the Capricornian earth, in that we're all driven by insecurity. That's what caused the fall in the first place. Uh, the last scene in the act is just a little scene setter. Lennox and another man are discussing uh, things that are going on, and Lennox repeats all of the uh, stories of the murders and uh, touts the party line of them being done by ungrateful uh, children. Lennox, uh, the, the other lord, then tells Lennox that uh, Malcolm, one of those supposed ungrateful children, has fled for England and that Edward of England has received him with open arms and is even helping him to get up in harmony. And at the same time that they are, they are uh, getting the uh, Duke of Northumberland to uh, come and assist them so that they can clean house in Scotland and give, give uh, Malcolm his rightful throne. Macduff, another one of the Scots lords, uh, who wasn't at the dinner, and they knew about that beforehand, has also absconded to England, and uh, all of these messages are passed on to Macbeth, and uh, both people are indignant at the state of their country and at the ambiguity of things, who really did the murders and how nasty it all is. Now, we have just one more scene that we're going to do tonight, and that's all. And that's this is the one where we'd like to have everybody read. There are three witches, Hecate and Macbeth. How are we going to accomplish this with two books? <laughs> I guess we don't have to. All right. All right, I'll, I'll read the parts. There's five parts. All right, Ela, you can be the first witch. Uh, Tim, you can be the second witch, and I'll be the third witch. And I'll be Hecate, too. Yeah. Oh, we're, we're going to read the whole thing. You are starting as the first witch. Help the air cries, tis time, tis time. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, witch's mummy, maw and gulf, of the raven sea shark, 
rid of him like big in the dark. There's those blaspheming Jew, gall of goat and slips of you, silvered in the moon's eclipse, nose of Turk in Tartar's lips, finger of birth strangled babe, ditch delivered by a drab, make the gruel thick and slab, add there two tigers chaudron for the ingredients of our cauldron. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Oh, well done. I commend your pains, and everyone shall spare in the games, shall share in the games. And now about the cauldron sing, like elves and fairies in a ring, enchanting all that put you put in. How now you seek secret black and midnight hags what is it to you, you all do? A deed without a name. I conjure you by that which you profess. profess. However you come to know it, answer me. Though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches, though the yeast, yeasty waves confound and swallow navigation up, though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down on their waters' heads, Though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations, though the treasure of nature's gremlins tumble, tumble together, even till destruction sicken, answer me to what I ask you. We'll answer. Call them. Let me see them. Come high or low, thyself thy office deftly show. Tell me, thou unknown power. He knows thy thoughts. Hear his speech, but say thou not. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Beware, Macduff. Beware the fane of Fife. Dismiss me. Enough. This is the, for people who don't have a book, this is an armed head that has appeared in the air. Whate'er thou art, for thy good caution, thanks. Thou hast harped my fear aright. But one word more. Had I three ears, I hear thee. Then live, Macduff, what need I fear of thee, but yet I'll make assurance double sure and take a bond of fate, thou shalt not live, that I may tell pale-hearted fear it lies and, and sleep in spite of thunder. Not to it. That will never be. Who can impress the forest? Did the tree unfix his earthbound root? Sweet bodaments, good. Rebellious dead, rise never till the wood of Burnham rise, and our high place Macbeth shall live the lease of nature, pay his breath to time and mortal custom. Yet my heart throbs to no one thing. Tell me, if your art can tell so much, shall Banquo's issue ever reign in this kingdom? Seek to know no more. I will be satisfied. Deny me this and an eternal curse fall on you. Let me know why stinks that cauldron and what noise is this? Show, show his eyes and grieve his heart. Come all shadows who depart. 
Thou art too like the spirit of Banquo. Down, thy crown doth seal my eyebrows, and thy hair, the other gold-brown brow, is like the first, the third like the former. Filthy hags, why do you show me this? A fourth, start eyes. What will the line stretch out of the crack, out to the crack of doom? Yet another, a seventh. I see no more, and yet an eighth appears who bears a glass which shows me many more, and some I see that two balls and treble scepters carry. Horrible sight, now I see tis true, for the blood-bolted bank will smiles upon me and points at him for his. Why is this so? Where are they? Gone? Let this pernicious hour stand, I accursed in the calendar. Come in without there. So are you the weird sisters? Can they not buy you? Infected be the air whereon they ride, and damned all those that trust them. I did hear the galloping of horse. Who was it came by? Fled to England? Time thou anticipatest my dread, dread, dread exploits. The flighty purpose never is overtook unless the deed go with it. From this moment the very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand. And ever not, and even now to crown my thoughts with axe and be if fought and done. Castle of Macduff I will surprise, seize upon Fife, give to it the edge of the sword, his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace, his, trace him to his line. No, boast, no boasting like a fool, this deed I'll do before the purpose cool. But no more sights, where are these gentlemen? Come, bring me, where are they? All right. <laughs> That's all the reading for tonight. That's all of the scene. The scene that we have just read is a little bit romantic. It does contain a lot of truth in it, but it is easy to get the illusion that magic is all a matter of stuff and not so much a matter of consciousness. It very clearly demonstrates what kind of magic is involved in this drama. It is nature magic. That is the use of occult forces that are latent in nature. There are some ethical uses of nature magic. Anytime we take herbal medicine, or just plain mineral medicine. That is a form of nature magic. It's using the essence that's in the plant or the character of the metal or compound that we're using and using it to change the natural state of our body. However, nature magic because it is primarily of the lower realms and of the forces that work unconsciously in the lower realms is very frequently used for selfish purposes. Black magic is filled with all kinds of selfish usage to destroy or to gain personal advantage. It doesn't mean that black magicians don't use higher forces such as thoughts and desires, which they certainly do. They can't use the realms of the spirit because that's out of their reach. But they do use thoughts and desire, but they take advantage of the forces that are free 
right within nature. So let's look at some of those, and then we'll get into the uh, deeper topic for tonight. Right in the beginning, it begins with a brindled cat. We've already seen that cats were used as used by familiars because of their energetic bodies. The brindling brings on a different side of what we talked about many times. We've talked about piebald horses with just the right mixture of black and white to bring a certain kind of consciousness, a conscious awareness between the known and the unknown. Brindling, in this case, means ambiguity. How the white is mixed with the dark or ambiguous moral persuasion. If it's completely brindled, that is a black cat, it's unambiguous evil. And again, the three stripes on the cat, that's again using the principle of otherworldly completion through the number three. Hedgehogs are very well known in magical spheres. They are supposedly the only animal common animal that is smart enough or cunning enough or clever enough to outsmart a fox. So it represents the low-grade kind of cunning. And hedgehogs have always been associated with lower magic, black magic. The kind of cunning that is associated with cunning women. Uh, at one time, any wise person was a woman was called a cunning woman. It goes all the way back to Atlantis. For some reason, hedgehogs were even more than cats associated with demonic possession. I don't know whether their ability to raise the spines indicates even more of an energy kind of quality than, uh, than a cat. I just don't know that. They were reputedly used for all sorts of treachery and evil. Probably they were Scorpio animals. So if you have, I don't know if porcupines come in the same way as a hedgehog. They're very close in evolution, but I'm not, I'm not sure. According to lore, which probably isn't true, they copulated standing up. And because, <laughs> because they copulated standing up, this meant that they were treacherous like humans were treacherous and that there was some kind of a sympathy between the common uh, treachery. Poisoned entrails were thrown into the pot. Entrails were always associated with breakdown and destruction and rot, you know, all of the bacterial and yeasty action in them. All of these items thrown in are things that are either associated with the destructive forces of nature, just like there are fairies that build things up. There are also elementals that tear things down. And all the things that are thrown into the pot are things that are either associated with destruction and tearing things down, or they are things that are associated with base desire and the desire being expressed through these items becomes built right into the stuff. And we'll see that again and again in there. Toad sweat, we mentioned that before, as being a very uh, dangerous psychedelic drug. Uh, they threw that in. The snake from a fenny bog. Again, the bogs are places where things rot and break down. And the vapors of the rot and those swamp gases were supposed to be hypnotic in quality. Uh, scorpion serpents are always associated with poison and deceit and magic and things like that. An eye of newt, uh, eyes of reptiles and amphibians were considered uh, psychedelic and they were also considered as windows to a two-way hypnosis. A lot of amphibians and reptiles are capable of hypnotizing or of being hypnotized through the eye. And so, this, so what is here is, again, that kind of a quality. All cold-blooded animals, uh, especially at the extremities, like at the, the toe or at the foot, were considered evil. The bats, the 
because they're night flying, again, they were associated with darkness, and because they hung upside down, which was an exact symbol of uh, inversion, and because they could refrigerate their blood, were often associated with evil. Dogs' tongues. Dogs are, almost all these animals are either Capricornian or Scorpion. Uh, dogs were considered uh, uh, inversions of evil. You've heard the story about the uh, agnostic, dyslexic uh, <laughs> uh, insomniac that laid in bed all night and wondered whether there really was a dog. <laughs> it's, it's an old joke, but uh, the dogs do not have uh, sweat glands, and dogs sweat through their tongue, and any... Uh, any organ of excrement, which is again where all the breakdown stuff comes out, was considered uh, to be covered with the uh, entities that were associated with evil and things like that. Uh, reptiles were considered uh, evil, especially the serpents. Uh, they were associated with the sexual power and all of the idea of the Lucifers. It's a strange thing that serpents cannot stand to be around pure sulfur. You have, if there's, you know where there's a snake hole and you want to get rid of that snake, uh, it doesn't have to even be 100% pure. You can get to 98% pure. Those pellets of blue sulfur, just drop them down the snake's hole and the snake is bye-bye. He won't come around. But at any rate, uh, they were associated with uh, poisonous characteristics. We've talked about owls and lizards before, and we've talked about cold extremities before. Dragons, uh, are even worse than reptiles, and they're worse than serpents. Uh, they represent a more potent kind of cunning and evil. And the scales are again seen as excrement, as are teeth. There's a few teeth that were thrown into the pot there. You're getting into some really, really heavy stuff. When they talk about the GI tract uh, of a witch, thrown into the pot, uh, a mummified uh, of a mummy at that, the gastrointestinal tract in one way is the inverse of the spine. The spine at least is a two-way street and the spine has the forces that go upward into the head and lead the consciousness upward and beyond. Whereas everything in the gastrointestinal tract uh, goes downward and it all ends up as excrement and it all ends up as being poisonous in that sense. So it's again associated with breakdown and with inversion and things going uh, the wrong way. Uh, this is probably the nastiest ingredient in the whole thing. The... Uh, Sharks are again a Capricornian animal and they're associated with bloodthirstiness and so taking the innards of sharks has the same quality. Hemlock, we know, was Saturnian and it was what they used to kill uh, uh, Socrates. It turns one very cold and if it's being uh, uh, harvested, uh, the root being harvested, being again the underground, the inverted part, if the head of the plant is in the ground and being harvested in the dark means that there's no purification by light. Uh, the liver is the seed of desire. Not to uh, cast aspersion on Jews, but uh, the Jews were reputed to be more selfish. So that is therefore the liver of a Jew would be very impregnated with selfishness. Goats, again, are ruled by a Capricorn, and their gall is supposed, is reputed to be able to digest or dissolve anything, including a tin can. So, <laughs> it's again more, much more of the same. Yews are again another Saturnine, uh, piney kind of tree, and the, uh, there the stunting quality of Saturn comes out. It stunts growth. In fact, that's what they're using it now. You, you know about the research with the, that they use it to stunt cancer growths. Uh, use work in that way. 
Uh, eclipsed moons means mean evil squared. Uh, they usually turn a dark reddish or something like that. Uh, I don't know that the noses of Turks and the lips of Tartars have any specific uh, uh, magical powers or anything like that. But when the Yeniseries were invading uh, Europe, I'm sure that just the mention of Turks and Tartars uh, brought fear to the people. Uh, a strangulation always means poisoned blood and a blue finger of a child babe, uh, of a strangled babe uh, would indicate that kind of poisoned blood. Uh, prostitutes were considered to be filled with evil, the sensuous desires, and illegitimate children were considered to be the inhabitants of evil beings. One tradition has it that Judas was an illegitimate child. I don't know whether to a prostitute or not. And another legend claims that the Antichrist will be born to uh, illegitimately to a nun who has uh, been unfaithful to her vows of uh, celibacy. Tigers uh, just represent ravenous and ferociousness and violence. The, Eket, the entrance of Hecat into the scene at various points represents that the big guns are being brought in. And, and if we look, they occur at crucial moments. And uh, when they're commanded to pour in the baboon's blood, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about the esotericism of baboon's blood, but we've, we've had quite enough tonight. As we've said before, the thumb represents will. And when one is carrying out an act of will, uh, the blood would be in the thumbs. I had a friend that used to be attacked by entities, and it was just a major activity. She was so psychically sensitive that they tried to make a institute for psychical research just around her. And uh, when she would, she would be attacked by beings, and I'd sleep on her living room floor, and they'd roll me back and forth just like I was a log, and it was terrifying. My hair, my hair would about stand on end. But she, it would took a big thing to get her not to grab her thumbs like that because once she did that, she was in, she was impairing her will. She couldn't express her will in a strong, positive way. Uh, the deed without a name is uh, means something that is not to be taken for granted. Anything that we can name we become familiar with and that familiarity gives us some kind of liberty that we take for granted. Going way back, once you knew the name of something, it became objectified and in its objectified state it had limitations. And knowing the name of someone, you automatically had a power over them. So a deed without a name is a deed that is seamless, that can't be broken into. Macbeth, in his speech, has no special meaning except that he wants to know uh, what is uh, coming up. He is now extremely resolute. He is so carried now into his uh, extroversion that he's not taking anything from within. The weird sisters want an even stronger statement from him. And they're saying that for him to participate in this deed, in this magic, in these visions or apparitions that are going to come, he has to be completely resolute. He has to give himself over completely to them and to their ends. So this, there's another reference in here to hierarchy. It's down along the line 63. Yes, the first witch says, this is after the Hecate has appeared with the three higher witches. In this scene, there are the three witches, and then Hecate appears with another three witches. 
And uh, then she says, "Will an one of the witches says, will answer. Say if the hadest rather, he rather hear it from us or from our masters. Meaning to say that there are higher levels that they can appeal to. I'm trying to get to the idea of hierarchy because it's important to, uh, to the whole concept here. The armed head that appears represents some kind of incorporeal intelligence. The fact that it is under armor means that it is impenetrable by human consciousness. It probably also means that there that you can expect that there's going to be warfare. Now, the bloody baby that is the second apparition after the armed head that's suspended in the air has at least two meanings. One is that Macduff was born by Caesarean section. And if uh, he can only look at the symbol, he can see the, what, that it's there, that it means. So if he's born by Caesarean section, he's a bloody baby. The other is is that Macbeth is now giving birth to bloody reserve, uh, resolve. Everything he wants to accomplish can only be accomplished by bloody resolve. It's really interesting that Macbeth only hears what he wants to be, what he wants to hear. Out of everything that's said, he only hears to be bold and to be bloody. He never considers the statement, none born of women. He never, even, he doesn't put the words together with the vision. Big mistake. Sound and light and words and vision are two very different things, and if you put them together, you can uh, get a much better understanding of things. The same kind of disparity occurs with the third vision. Even though he sees a crowned child, son of a king, he doesn't think through the statement about a whole forest moving away and coming to the castle. Again, he only hears what he wants to hear, and that is the, the uh, charge to try to override the first prediction, predictions. None of these predictions override the first ones. They just actually tell more about them. The last vision of Banquo with eight descendants, when he sees that, he gets angry. He can't have his own way, and rather than look at it and try to understand what it means, He's like a spoiled child, and he's just like ourselves. When we're thwarted and we don't get our way, we get angry right off the bat. It's true that the hags do tell him to take bold action, but they're being very misleading, but even in their misleading, they haven't lied. Because what they're doing is presenting things of destiny that are coming out of the ethers, but they're presenting them in a symbolic fashion. And they can't produce what is untrue. They have, you know, what is there is there. The fact that this last vision of a long line of descendants from Banquo should cause him to reflect on the other ones, but he doesn't. Psychologically, this scene is very, very interesting. We've said all along that Macbeth is an extrovert. Extroverts don't do well with words because words are invisible. That part isn't surprising that he doesn't listen to what the words say and consider possible interpretation. He's an extrovert and he sees the image and he interprets the image to mean what he wants or thinks it means one image, one meaning. Whereas words can have many different interpretations. The thing is, even being an extrovert, he doesn't even get the images right. Once he has overstepped himself, He's overstepping all the laws that are behind nature. And consequently, 
he's going to misinterpret or missee anything that is around him. They don't have to be fantastic visions. Even a smirk on somebody's face can be misunderstood. He's carried away by what he thinks is a success generated by him in all of his carefulness where he tries to wipe off everything that gets in his way. So he has been so carried away with himself that he has gotten beyond his forte, beyond vision. He assumes that he knows what the images mean instead of really poring over them, getting some uh, corroboration. When he encounters one that he can't deny and that he doesn't like, he just responds with pride. Assuming pride takes a personal affront. If you're making too much of yourself in the first place, then you're going to make too much of yourself in the pride, in the affront. So we see he's about ready for downfall. Now, since this is the last appearance of the witches, it seems an appropriate uh, time to ask one of those hard questions, and that is, who are the weird sisters? We're going to look in at the weird sisters as something of a composite. They're not just one thing they are several things put together. Three, as we have often noted, is the number that represents completing something spiritually. If one is alone, one is myopic. Two are always polarized. But three are triangulated and completed so when we're talking about the weird sisters, we're talking about a very simple formation. Something like a cell, like what Carlos Castaneda would call a narwhal group, or like a healing formation of Rosicrucians where they position themselves geometrically according to character and focus certain kinds of energies to be available for healing. working together, and in such a formation, they get their job done, and they satisfy their desires, and their desires are deadly mischief. That's what inversion is all about. They try to work against things. They're out to satisfy themselves, and they revel in nastiness. It seems awfully petty, but that's what happens get turned around and get things upside down. People who are making a brew like this obviously are inverted in some way. However, this is not merely unattended mischief. At the significant points in this ceremony, there are three more witches. And with the three witches, there is the queen of the witches that they all appear from above. So the organization is not just a horizontal formation. It's not just three people working together to carry something out. It's a vertical. That means there is a hierarchy. Now, several years ago, we did uh, three years of talk about hierarchy in various mythologies. Hindu mythology, Egyptian mythology, Greek mythology, and Northern European mythology. Our goal at that time was to understand precedence and priority. What is more important and what things come first. Even though we took three years to do that, we left an awful lot that was unsaid. One of the things that was not said was the parallelism 
at various hierarchical levels. There's always a similarity on the various levels, and things are re reconstructed on different levels. There are horizontal differences according to what is carried out on each plane of hierarchy, but there is a unified character that carries through all of them. This is manifest in the whole principle of analogy. This is how the one stays one from the most rare spiritual state down to the deepest state of manifestation. As above, so below, what has gone before in heaven will follow after on earth. Know this and rejoice. In the weird sisters, we see this in action. When we have Hecate and the uh, three higher witches on another level, it represents a uh, tetrad. That is a threefold group with one central force working into it. The simplest of the geometric, perfect geometric figures. Now Shakespeare couldn't do a really detailed study in a few short scenes without ruining the whole pace of the play. And we can't even do much of a study in a very brief talk. So let's try to look at this in a much deeper way. The word weird is a weird word. If we trace it into uh, Northern European uh, uh, languages, it turns out to be weird, is where the word weird comes from. Weird means primal or virgin. So what we're talking about here is something very ancient and something primally pure. These hags are no doubt very ancient virgins. They represent something that is old in some ways without taint. In Macbeth, it's something that's the meaning of it has become inverted. But even looking at it as base magic, even black magicians are celibate for the same reason that white musician, magicians are celibate. Because that's where you develop the energy. Urd also means primordial life. Because there is the world tree or the cosmic tree, the Yggdrasil tree. And that tree has three roots. And one of those roots belongs to the gods. And at that root was the fountain of Urd. And out of it came the water of life. The water of life that kept the cosmic tree alive and everything else that lived. So we're talking about something primordial, something virgin, something that is filled with life. But the life had to become form in order to be manifest. So Gurd and her two sisters served what they called the Orlog, which meant Urlog. And Ur then represents primordial, and Log represents organization. So this is just like the, this is like the same as our Lagos. So this is the primordial word or the primordial organization that has its own kind of law within it. The three virgin sisters over endless time 
and brought down into the earth become the weird sisters in our story. In high mythology, they are called Norns. And the Norns are the northern European version of the face. Urd was called the primordial spinner. And she spun the thread of life. Skuld measured out the thread of life and represented the delineation. Urd represented the past because everything new is spun out of the past. The present was Skuld, which was the delineation of the past into the present. Verdande, whose name means becoming, represents the future. So these three represent the three states of time, past, present, and future. In uh, German and several other languages, Verden means uh, will become. So these three sisters meet out on every level of the cosmos. They meet out life in time, according to the Orlog. If we look at them in Greek, we get a slightly different view, which helps us to understand just a little more. In Greek, they were called the Fates. Sometimes they were the, called the More. And sometimes they were called the Parse. <laughs> All right. They, in Greece, they were dressed in white, which again has that virgin quality about it. But instead of being associated with the realm of the gods, they had their set up near the throne of Hades in the underworld. Some Greek mythographers claim that they were the children of Erebus, which means the covered, and night. Others say they were not only virgin, but that they were born by parthenogenesis and that their mother was the great goddess necessity which is again the Urd in the form of the Orlog. Clotho was the youngest the spinner and she spins the thread of time and fate and she hands it over to Lachis, the measurer. She's got a rod. She measures it out. And then she hands out the measured thread to Atropos, or Atropos, which means she who cannot be turned. She's the smallest one of the three and the most terrible, and she cuts it. There's a few paradoxes in here. How can we reconcile the youngest being Clotho or Urd who supposedly rules the past? How can we rec reconcile the, with the past being associated with the youngest? If we look at it from the divine point of view, we look at it with titanic time. And in titanic time, things go the opposite. That is, the more that the creative dream is expressed and spun out from the consciousness that produces it, the more the spirit is relieved and buoyed up and the more soul power it has so that the spirit gets younger as the form gets older, as more of the story is told and the weight of 
creation is lifted off. Now, how do we reconcile the Orlog and the Rurden sisters with Hecate and the witches? That seems a much more difficult kind of thing to do. But it actually isn't. It is actually a rather simple thing. It's just a matter of perspective. When we rebelled and we became disobedient to the divine plan, we began to see the law, which is inexorable because it's right in us, we began to see it with different eyes. In our rebellion, we have become egoistic, arrogant, and proud, very much like Macbeth, the hero that represents us. We, fr- we tried to thwart the divine plan, and we tried to thwart the law itself, but we couldn't do that because it was right in us. So we just changed our attitude. And we saw anything that thwarted our arrogant desire for power, we saw the law then as a terrible taskmaster. We had a bad attitude about it. Like Macbeth, we refused to accept responsibility for the consequences of our action. We blamed our pain on the face and we turned them into hags. So complete is our inversion that we begin sometimes to thrill more in destruction than in creation. More in the form of things than in the spiritual life of things. In our arrogance, it became desirable for us to see ourselves as gods by petty manipulations of nature and magic. Hence, everything from word or the great goddess of necessity all the way down, we produced in our attitude a hierarchy of night or a hierarchy of darkness. And that parallels the entire uh, creation. In the Greek mythology, the Olympic version of the creation, there is indeed two slopes to the mountain. One slope is the side of creation, and the other slope is the night side, and it's all destruction all the way down. Each level whether it is on the day side or on the night side, each level is a parallel of the original all the way right to the fountainhead, the Ud fountain. If we really look at what happened here on this very low petty level, the Ud sisters didn't do any prodigious act of magic. They happen to materialize a few images out of the ethers in symbolic form, and they materialized a uh, knife, which we don't even know was a projection from the bat. They didn't have to do any prodigious magic because Macbeth was willing to do what he what they wanted in the first place. All they did is present it to Macbeth in a way that things, in a way that would be misunderstood because that's the way he wanted to hear things and carried out in a way that would produce mischief and mayhem. The whole definition is by darkness. It's a spiteful, nasty, malicious, petty way of looking at things, but that's all the weird sisters are. They are a reproduction of a formation that we can follow all the way back to the Godhead. 
and the fountain of all things. So on one level then, the weird sisters are counterfeiters. They're acting out higher levels of a dark hierarchy in a vain, petty, negative, intentionally destructive way. The entities that are involved with rot are important because things have to be broken down to be used the next time around. But when it comes uh, down to just uh, mayhem and maliciousness that the weird sisters uh, carry out, it's just very petty. But they know that they can be effective by using not only the forces that are in uh, uh, eyes of newts or Jews' livers or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> whatever romantic notions they're having, they know that their formation, that the way things are put together will work, and they use it, and they use it in a very petty way. So that's all they are, is lower human beings representing 